Hello and welcome to the program. My name is Kali Ikwe and this is Violence Free World. We are continuing our conversation with Chief Femi Fani Kayode, very, 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 very interesting personality. Chief, you're welcome to our program again. Thank you very much. Well, we'll come right back into the conversation but after this time. My name is Kali Ikwe. Don't go anywhere. The raging spirit of violence in Nigeria has continued to defy all forms of approach at resolving it. Virtually all parts of Nigeria face this challenge which ranges from banditry in the northwest, kidnapping on our highways, the IPOB menace in the southeast, Killer headsmen in the southwest and the Midbird. Two, insurgency in the northeast. Particularly, the new trend of hostage taking for huge ransom, mostly borne by the government, has become rather too often and smacks of complicity from very high quarters. We also have situation where children are kidnapped at different levels and at different intervals. And what happens at the end of the day is that we take money to go and beg them to release our children to us. So if you, now, you are now on a negotiation table, who determines the pace of where the, nego the pendulum swings to? Now if you look at all this, the question is, who is having upper hand as at now? Can we conveniently? boldly, truthfully say that our security is having an upper hand. Public outcry against this trend has dominated national discourse with some sectors resorting to self-help by way of vigilante groups like in the case of Amotekun in the southwest and JTF in the north, a measure that is more or less official by now. The attendant fear and anxiety have brought about a rhetoric of fury as people trade accusations and counter accusation as to who is responsible for the dastardly acts. We have avalanche of laws in this country that criminalizes terrorism. We have avalanche of laws in this country that criminalizes kidnapping, abduction and the like. Now all these laws have not been put to place against any one of these people. To the best of my knowledge, look at the number of those that were arrested and after arrest, they will be handed over to their governors as repentant, as repentant um, terrorists. This Bandits. is the only country in the whole world that have had that people will kill villagers, turn children to orphan overnight, sack a whole village, destroy properties that are worth millions of naira, destroy the economy of a state, and at the end of the day, the state itself, all, uh, the security agencies will hand them over to their governors, and they will be received with high level of uh, popantry and then uh, joy and all those stuff like that. Ethnic and religious profiling have regrettably featured too prominently in the blame game, and it is only serving to exacerbate the already bad situation. Yes. I feel terrible when Nigerian, the average Nigerian sees crime and criminality within a narrow prism of tribe or religion. It's in vogue now world over that Muslims are really the culprits. Xenophobia. Mus Muslims are seen as terrorists because terrorism is a multi-billion dollar industry all over. And Muslims, unfortunately, has where it takes because mainly the oil wells are with the Muslim countries. It's all about that. Dialogue, it is record, holds a potential to ultimately resolve the spate of violence and consolidate our effort at national integration. But just how can we aggregate our opinions to make the dialogue measure work as we seek a violence-free Nigeria? Hello and welcome, my name is Kali Ipe and this is Violence Free World. 
we are continuing with our conversation with Chief Femi Fanikari, former Minister of Aviation and now a chieftain of the All Progressive Congress. It seems like this has become, the violence is now fully national. And a lot of people blame this on uh, the reluctance of government in dealing with corporates once identified. When, when you should, in fact, that's what they call impunity. You know you do this and you are killing the terrorists like flies in the northwest today. You go to the northeast, look at what's happening there. Compared to what happened a year, two years, three years ago. I mean, for goodness sake, look at what Zulim is doing with the federal forces. Uh, Governor Zulim of Bonose, look at what the UB governor is doing with federal forces. Look at what's going on there. They are killing Boko Haram morning, day, and night. It's a much more vigorous fight than it was two, three years ago. And that is why... We have to retrace that. We are in a situation of war in this country, as far as I'm concerned. And let me tell you, these terrorist organizations, whether it's ISWAP, whether it is Boko Haram, whether it is the, 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 the foreign terrorists, the foreign foreign terrorists, they're all being funded from abroad in order to destabilize and destroy Nigeria. So whilst others are talking about party politics in 2023, we are talking about fighting the terrorists that are being funded by people from abroad. We're talking about keeping Nigeria one, and we're ensuring that we continue to talk to one another, we continue to build bridges, we continue to ensure that our country is in peace and to fight those that want to disturb our peace. That is the priority for me and others now. Chief, all of this one has centered on dialogue, to which you have participated actively, or I'm impressed, I must say. But now we have an opportunity to test our reserve again as 2023 approaches. People, the rhetoric of fury, people are talking tough, north versus south. Regrettably, recently, there was a pronouncement, a declaration from the, the South uh, Southern governors that the presidency must come to the South. Then the North responded that it is unconstitutional. So these are words, these are actions that do not serve to promote the unity to which you stand for now. Most of these persons are your friends. What would you say to, to the issue? Well, first of all, the word must um, has no meaning in politics. The minute you say somebody must do something, um, then you know you've lost that person. Um, you have to tread with caution in terms of um, expressing yourself when it comes to the power game. Um, northerners are as much Nigerians as Southerners are, and Southerners are as much Nigerians as Northerners are. We have to work together. Uh, 2023, whoever becomes kind of wherever the presidency is zoned to, if at all it's zoned, is a question for the parties. Now, I, I, I you know, I, I, I understand the aspirations, and I've argued it before in the past about the idea of having a president from the South, and so on and so forth. And I appreciate that. I appreciate the concerns. Um, but what you must never do is come up and say, it must come to me. If it doesn't come to me, there'll be consequences. It's my turn and I must get it. The minute you start that kind of rhetoric, the other side are bound to say, well, we don't understand the meaning of must. This is a game of numbers. This is a game of for, for a decision to be made by each of the parties. And, 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 and they may take an opposing view. Um, so, so we need to be a little bit careful. And, and this is a very divisive um, um, time that we're entering into. Because if you look at it, the, the governors from the South have said are cross party lines. It's not just PDP or AP, it's across party lines. And um, But what I would urge is restraint, understanding, uh, and dialogue again. Let's work these things out quietly and privately and let the parties decide and let's see where the presidency will go. Zoning in itself you know, can be something that um, is, is problematic, as you know. Um, you know why, why everybody in this country, regardless of where you come from, has a constitutional right to run for the president. I, I, I'm not sure if the constitution allows an independent candidate yet. I hope it does. Maybe one day it will, if, if not yet. But I mean, you can't say you, somebody doesn't have the right to run. And if you do insist on zoning, then you have to look at it a little bit closely. Where, which are the zones that have never produced a democratically elected president in this country? Well, I'm going to come there, Because if you take it to the logical, if, if you want to talk about zoning, then you have to talk about the fact region by region. Right. Right. Some zones that have never, have never ever produced a president. So in the name of equity, why would you ignore those zones and talk about, and talk about another zone or talk about a region? 
uh, a zone like the Northeast, for example, has produced one president, uh, a democratically elected president, only for six years. Well, he wasn't a president, prime minister, chief executive of the state. And the man was killed after six years, a great man by the name of Satafra Balewa. Okay, since then, they've only produced uh, a vice president in the name of, uh, in the person of Abu Bakr Tiku. So that's one, okay? In, in 61 years, they've only had six years. If you look at the North Central Zone, um, where my friend comes from, uh, Bello, Governor Bello, um, um, they've never produced a democratically elected um, president in the history of this country. They've never produced a democratically elected vice president in this country before. So where do they stand? If you look at the Southeast, they've only ever um, produced a vice president a democratic elected vice president, the person of um, Kwame, you know, in, in our history. So when you talk about zoning, you have to be very, very careful. You either have it, and if you're going to have it, then you have to be equitable and reasonable and say, look, who has had it more than others, who has not, and maybe we should look at the zones that have not had it, okay? But, if you, if it, but as a principle, you could also say, listen, it's about time we stop looking at this type of very, very... Um, uh, what word can I use? Uh, uh, con constraining factors like zoning. And let's look at, let's search for the best man. Let, let's, let's forget about that and let everybody exercise their constitutional right to run for the nomination to be flag bearer of their party. Because we're entering a phase in Nigeria that unity and peace is paramount. That is what we have to ensure. And we have to ensure that this country does not fall apart. And 2023 will be a defining moment. So we have to think about it before we, we, we start making some Yeah, you're talking, Chief, you're talking about inclusiveness more or less like for everyone. Now, mm -hmm. even the VAT issue didn't help matters in this time. Some states going to say, okay, we um, call them VAT, so we, should, we should be allowed. Because some states are in the court right now. Yeah. Lagos have just asked them to join the suit, and the whole lot of them, many more, are sending all of their stuff off. I do not know how this helps us stay. This sounds to me more like even the zoning issue where you're living into a matter of the yeah. health versus south. Sure. And even the, the northern governors are now looking, okay, because you feel mm. um, you, have, you, you, you start to gain a lot more, what do you say to that? Well, again, it's, it's a very, very challenging time. These are very divisive issues and if we want to talk about states, the governor will talk about his state, his state must collect everything from that. Well, he's talking only for himself but, and for his state. But what he doesn't, what he fails to appreciate is that that single action of keeping it all to myself might have implications for the country at large, the bigger and wider country. If you, if, I mean, look, as a, as a Christian, I'll tell you this, and I believe it's the same with the Muslims. Uh, let me give you an example. Somebody's cooking food in his house, has plenty of food in his house, okay? And, um, and the next door neighbor can smell the aroma of that beautiful food that's being cooked every day. Meanwhile, the next door neighbor has no food in his own house at all, but he's smelling this every day. Is it not right and proper, according to Christian and Muslim tenets, okay, and principles, to share what you have? with your next door neighbor. Is that not the way it's supposed to be? The answer is yes, it's supposed to be like that. You assist those that may not have as much as you, you know, as, as much as possible. This is a principle that is well entrenched in every major religion. That's how we're supposed to, we're supposed to share. And we're supposed to, especially in a national context where some regions and some states have far more resources than others. So by the time we now say no, we're gonna move away from that. Is it not wrong? Is it not a little bit ungodly? Is it not against our faith to say that I will keep everything for myself because it derives from here? You are depriving others of a resource and of something that you know, they ought to also have a little piece of. That's my own view, you understand me. So that's the first challenge. The second challenge is that if you insist on doing that, uh, you will probably find that after a while, your gas, your gas uh, cylinder, which you are using to cook the food, the neighbor may well climb over and, and take your gas cylinder and make life difficult for you. You may send your children out to go and buy food somewhere. You may find that they come back without, without having any money on them because they've been robbed along the way because people are feeling the pinch and others don't have. And they, they resort to desperate measures. I'm not saying anybody would do that. I'm just using this as an example of the danger of saying we must have everything ourselves. Then there's one more argument, which I think is a very profound one, and that is this, that if you say that everything that Lagos generates must remain in Lagos, uh, and the VAT must remain in Lagos, if you say that, okay, I believe, my own view, is that we do need to be our brother's keeper. We do need to ensure 
that as much as you keep as much as you can for yourself, you must be able to find something for those that may not have as much as you have. You must be able to share. You must be able to, to understand that, look, this development and this, this progress you've made did not just come out of thin air. It came as a consequence of you being part of a whole, and we need to work together and look after one another. At this point in time when tempers are high and, 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 and anything can happen in our country. Well, as we went down, Chief, let's go. I, I, let me take you back to a conversation that we're having. We, yeah. you, you, you told me much about your involvement with Sunday Igbo and how you've gotten him to do things that uh, we add to the peace process generally in Nigeria. You were seen, also seen with Namdi Kanu of IPOB. Mm and the, some people even believe you're friends or so. What is your relationship with Nnamdi Kanu presently as he stands? Do, can, can he trust you? First of all, it's not, it, you know, if you're a friend with somebody, you're a friend with somebody. Yeah. My own view, and they are not the only people that have been locked up. I've been locked up, even by this government. I was locked up by Jonathan's, uh, by, by, uh, by Yaradwa's government and Jonathan's government too, on a number of occasions. I've been locked up by this government. And I've been put in Boko Haram cells by this government. Okay? So everybody goes through this process at some point in time. And I empathize with anybody in that situation. Uh, you ask whether he's still my friend. When his lawyer was attacked in 2016, and uh, people were killed in his compound, and his home was burnt, and so on and so forth. I've been there the day before. Who did the lawyer call? If I had your for, he's alive, he's moving around. Ask him. It was me he called, and I made an intervention, and the soldiers were pulled out within three hours. That was in 20, sorry, 2017 or thereabouts. Again, earlier on this year, when they came to his house, killed some of his aides and bodyguards, security forces, and tried to kill him, who did he call at 3 a.m. in the morning? It was me. We pushed the right buttons, and, and the young man. Uh, managed to get out, get out of the place with his life. And what did I do? I took him to go and meet uh, a key government official, I won't say it was, to ensure that they don't try and kill him again. And we got that guarantee at that time. That's what friends do. In the case of uh, Sunday Igbohu, when they came to his house in the middle of the night, who did he call? He called me, 3 a.m. in the morning. They killed some of his people there. And I advised him strongly on what to do, and so on and so forth. And, 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 and uh, you know, he, he, he's where he is today, unfortunately. Now, I don't renounce my friends. I don't turn my back on my friends. What I say to my friends privately is not what I'll say publicly. What I advise them to do privately is not what I'll say publicly, and vice versa, okay? And they know very well that I'm a politician. They also know that I will do the right thing at the right time for all those that are my friends. I know what he feels, but I want you to go and find out about what he, whether he thinks I'm doing the right thing. All I'm doing, the same with uh, Namdi Kanu, his lawyer sees me regularly, and they know the input I've made in terms of ensuring that their rights are protected, the rights that they're protected, not in terms of justifying any criminal actions they may have been involved in. And if that's the case, I fight and I look for hopefully a political solution to these matters, okay? But what I will tell you is this, okay? I never betray my friends. I stand by my friends. I have old friends. I have new friends. And that's what any serious player ought to be able to say, that we can bring anybody to the table. Nelson Mandela was locked up for I was it 26 years or whatever it was by the white boys of South Africa. He was there. He eventually came out and he became president of the country as a consequence of negotiation. We must negotiate these areas. We must negotiate these things. There are some that are still shouting, Sunday must do this, we must fight, we must do this. And I'm saying they're not even in touch with him. They're not supporting, they're not helping him. They don't care about him and his family. We know those that, that, that do care about him and that have been advising him on how to resolve this issue and, and how to build bridges and so on and so forth. We know who they are. How soon can these guys get out of jail? That is a question you put to the federal government. All I'll know, all I'll tell you is that it is very important for us in order to have national stability, to have dialogue with everybody, including them. It is very, very important. I, 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 I know the massive support base and power these gentlemen wield. And as much as I, 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 I'm, you know, I'm in the APC now, I've said it all along, that my core values and my principles I'll carry wherever I am. And um, I've said it over and over again. In order for us to have a united, peaceful Nigeria, we must have the courage to discuss 
issues with anybody and everybody. Those we didn't like yesterday and those we don't like today. We must be able to. It's not about friendship. It's about Nigeria. And that's the most important thing. So we must work together. We must build bridges. And we must bring everybody on board to ensure peace. These people are relevant. And, uh, you know, I... You know, we must accommodate them. You understand me? And those that say they want to leave the country, I don't believe we should kill them. I don't believe we should lock them up. I believe strongly in dialogue, understanding them. And if you want them to stay, you treat them with sensitivity, compassion, and understanding. That's my, that was my position then, and that is my position today. And I'm putting that position to a president and a government that is sensitive to this and, is, and has the presence of mind to listen to me and accommodate these views and perhaps even contribute to policy. That's what I hope will happen. Let's see what will happen. Well, we'll come right back into the conversation, but after this time, my name is Kali Ipe. Don't go anywhere. Lack of inclusiveness breeds distrust and ultimately engenders restiveness. Ignoring the youth who constitute the bulk of our population is a sure recipe for disaster. No sane society should consign its youth to the background. Hand in hand with our youth, and we can build a strong, prosperous, and peaceful nation. I am Yahya Bello, and I believe we can have a violence-free Nigeria. Hello and welcome. My name is Kali Ipe and this is Violence Free World. Let me just go straight into this conversation now, right now. We were talking about models for how we can get out of where we are today as far as insecurity is concerned. Mm. And I remember you were on the stage with me back there in Kogi uh, during Governor Bellu's mm. 46th birthday. And we were talking about how come he's not sharing his um, his his model, his um, his principles with the rest of his colleagues and so on? Some persons will even tell you that he's just being lucky here. In this case, what's really going on there? What's what what is your friend just lucky? <laughs> or, or I, I, what's I, happening? Well, I, I'm not sure it has much to do with luck. Is he's diligent, hardworking, and very focused? No, uh, particularly, I will tell you now. Kogi State was going to be the second home for Boko Haram. Yeah. No, right? I, I, yeah. Yes, yeah. Kogi State was going to be the second sure. home for Boko sure. Haram. Something he did, and it is reversed, it is not the case anymore. Now, they don't have their flag hosted anywhere there. That, that, what that, did he do That came as a share? consequence of hard work, diligence, and courage, which is where I was heading. Um, his, his case is an extraordinary one. Um, Yes, you could say that it's divine providence he became governor the way he became governor. Um, it's not ordinary. The man that uh, would have been governor dropped dead on the day that he was elected, and um, he now emerged as the governor of the state. Um, but since that time, look at what has happened in the state. And it's unfortunate a lot of people seem to want to underplay this and, 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 and come up with disinformation and misinformation about him. I think that's one of the unfortunate things that happens in this country. They, they tend to shoot down their best and they tend to lift up the very, very worst, you understand. That's just Nigeria for you. But look at it. You made the point, and you're absolutely right. There was a time when he first came in, or just after he came in, the, the plan was to ensure that the headquarters for Boko Haram was in Kogi State. And they were boasting how they'd hoist their flag there and so on and so forth and make it the headquarters for Boko Haram in this country. What did he do? He came in, he fought them head on, he drove them out, he pulled down their flags, and he made his own state one of the most crime-free states in the country. That is an extraordinary achievement. You know, kidnappers were eliminated whenever they were caught. It was done quietly, it was done effectively, and the most interesting of all, the LGA chairman themselves, together with the governors themselves, sometimes participated in these security operations. How many governors are ready to risk their lives the way he has risked his life? How many of them have committed their, uh, their, their, their council chairman to do the same? How many of them have fought the bandits, the terrorists, the way he has fought them? And crime generally. This is what he has managed to do quietly and effectively. And I commend him for that. It took courage, it took guts, and it took a lot of dedication and commitment. And I'm very proud of it. Couldn't it just be that because he's enjoying so much favor from the president, to a lot of people reports that he's so close to 
Well, you know, the, I, it, even if you enjoy all the favor in the world from the president, if you're not prepared to do the right thing and take the risk, take the bull by the horns and fight the evil, you're not going to go very far. He has utilized uh, his connections and his links with the villa in a very positive way. And they've supported him in everything that he's doing. And that's one of the things that I found attractive that, you know, about them. You have a, a young man like this that is dedicated to ensuring that he brings the very best in terms of uh, um, security to his people and they have supported him wholeheartedly and it works and it does work no matter what anybody says about Yaya Bello he has effected that and this is a template that I think needs to be translated to the whole country he has effected it he cares about it he's compassionate and he's kind I saw that when we were having our negotiations with all the people that we, we, we discussed with uh, over the other issues that I mentioned earlier. And um, I'm very proud of what he has managed to do in Kogi State in terms of security, and I sincerely hope that others will learn from it. Well, I think um, Abol Hussein is a very good point to leave, but I'd I'll, 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 I'll like you to give us your parting words as we conclude this interview. My parting words. Well, yes. <laughs> my parting words is that the most important thing for no, especially with regards to yeah. youth's involvement with violence. Okay, sure. With violence. Well, first of all, there is no place for violence in our country. Um, we lost, well, so many people in the Civil War. Um, three million Igbos were killed in the Civil War. And I, I still maintain that we need to apologize for that. I've said it before, I say it again. We, civilians, I'm saying. So many people were killed on the Nigerian side as well. Um, we also have to think about an apology for the civilians who were killed on the Nigerian side as well. We've been through hell in this country. Hundreds and thousands of people, millions of people have been slaughtered. Uh, violence is something that uh, uh, will destroy us all if we're not careful. Unfortunately, we have become probably the most violent country on earth today. We have become uh, one of the leaders in terrorism in the world today. And uh, this is the challenge that we're facing. And where is it all coming from? You and I know very well those that want to destroy our country. Most people don't. Most people live in another world. They don't even know what's going on in the international community. They'd rather talk about 2023 and about who has betrayed who and who is doing what and who is with who and whatever is going on. But those of us that are, understand international politics will accept the fact that there is a lot of you know interest to ensure that we are destabilized, that we are destroyed, that we fight one another, we kill one another, we end up having a massive civil war which will present you know a very good opportunity for them to sell their arms and turn us all into refugees and destroy the greatest hope for the black man on this planet and it is for us to ensure that they don't succeed that we preserve our unity we preserve our peace we preserve our dignity we bring our people together and we shouldn't be ashamed of wanting to build bridges and having peace and talking to everybody i have no apology whatsoever for sitting down and talking to president buhari talking to and i and i and i and i and i am very touched by the fact that he had the presence of mind and the decency to receive me in the way that he did. I have no apology whatsoever for that. And I would do it all over again, given the fact that I know what a lot of other people don't know, that things are changing in this country and we can make it work. And I will do all I can to ensure. But violence, no place for violence from any quarter whatsoever. And we must resist it in all shapes and in all forms. Well, Chief, I think that's a very good point to leave it. I must say at this point that I share your optimism. I'm excited at it. Mm. I feel most hopeful, and we believe we'll get, come back to you very soon. Well, I've been speaking with Chief Femi Fanny Coyote, former Minister of Innovation, and now a Chieftain of the All Progressive uh, Congress. Chief, once again, thank you very much for obliging thank us. Thank you very much. Same time next week, promises more if you endeavor to be here. Until then, please remember to remain on the road to a violence free Nigeria. My name is Kali Igwe. Thank you for watching. God bless. No more to violence.